Good afternoon, and welcome to the Republican Jewish Coalition Jewish Policy Center joint webinar. It's a first for us. I am Shoshana Bryan, Senior Director of the Jewish Policy Center and your host. The JPC, for those of you who haven't met us yet, is the separate, nonprofit, non-political think tank arm of the RJC. We are commonly referred to by our cousins there as propeller heads and beanie burns. We are proud of that. You can find our work on our website at jewishpolicycenter.org. Today, both sides of us are thrilled to welcome Jason Greenblatt, the son of Hungarian Jewish refugees to the United States. He was the executive vice president and chief legal officer to Donald Trump and the Trump Organization. In January 2017, he was appointed by President Trump as an assistant to the president and special representative for international negotiations. He was one of the chief architects of the optimistic, but unfortunately short-lived, uh, Peace to Prosperity Plan, offering Palestinians a legitimate shot at something good for their people. He was also a key player in the development of the much more successful Abraham Accords. And he has written a great book uh, called In the Path of Abraham, How Donald Trump Made Peace in the Middle East and How to Stop Joe Biden from Unmaking It. Here's the book. Everybody look. It is a great book. I strongly recommend it. So I want to get right into this. Jason Greenblatt, welcome to our program. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for hosting me. Our pleasure. So the what of the Abraham Accords is pretty well known. The how is less well known. The professional peace processors, peace processors, you can't even say the word, in the United States have been trying simply to split the difference between Palestinians and Israelis for 30 years and it hasn't worked. So I have two questions, and then I'm gonna sit back and listen. First, was there a point at which you thought splitting the difference was viable? And second, would you start by telling us how you came to understand that, A, that was not going to produce the peace we hoped for, but also that it didn't have to close off other avenues of conversation between Israelis and Arabs in the region, and maybe agreements between Israelis and Arabs in the region. What was the evolution of your thinking? Great multi-part question. I feel like I'm uh, the press secretary at the White House, but important questions. So there was no point at which we felt that splitting the difference would make peace achievable. We always kept, um, with, we always understood the mission to be not just signing something, either a term sheet or a peace agreement, but something that actually worked long-term and splitting the difference doesn't work long-term. How do you split the difference on security? You can't. How do you split the difference on Jerusalem, Jewish, Judaism's holiest sites, even though Muslims certainly have holy sites there as well, and Christians too? How do you split the difference on people that are called refugees, the Palestinian so-called refugees, most of whom are not actually refugees by any definition in the world? There's a little bit of a dispute on that. Are they the only group that are called refugees. Uh, some say yes, others say no, meaning generational refugees. Um, maybe, arguably, people think that they could split land in terms of that, but then you get right back into Jerusalem, you get right back into security. So splitting the difference, I don't think ever entered into our minds. Um, was there a point at which we thought that there would be traction? Yeah, all of 2017, uh, prior to the Palestinian Authority cutting ties with us because President Trump um, made his bold and courageous historic decision, really honoring US law, something he campaigned on. Uh, so until the point that the Palestinian leadership cut us off, the Palestinian leadership did lead us to believe that they would enter into good faith talks with Israel with no preconditions. As time went on, that became more and more clear to me that that wouldn't happen. So to get to the third aspect of your question, during that time in 2017, it also became clear that although the initial meetings with the Arab countries, were, they were very clear, they support Palestinian statehood and they gave us all the usual talking points that we've all read about, you know, a, Palestine, a fully sovereign Palestinian state on the 67 borders with East Jerusalem as the capital, et cetera, et cetera. There was also something else beginning to grow in the ground, which are these green shoots of a recognition that Israel is an important uh, neighbor they could, in theory, become an important ally. And essentially went from conversations where the word Israel was sort of whispered 
to outright talking about Israel, never once in a pejorative way, more in a way of trying to understand. And I think the reason is that we went in as strong Israel advocates, as strong Israel friends. We weren't afraid to say it. And I think we earned respect because of it. So you had this meeting at the Dead Sea in 2017 with Jordan, Egypt, and the Palestinians. Was that a kind of epiphany for you? Um, can you tell us about the meeting? I really didn't know very much about that meeting until I read the book. Yeah, um, and it wasn't just uh, Jordan and the Palestinians, but it was the Arab League Summit. So that's the confab where most of the Arab countries show up. Um, you know, I, I had mixed, I had a mixed time there. On the one hand, I went into meetings with the foreign ministers and in some cases leaders of the Arab countries. And I'd walk out of some of those rooms thinking, that's remarkable. How is it that this country that I've read so many things about, I won't name which, but you could imagine, that I was told were enemies of the state of Israel, were enemies of the Jewish people, would never make peace with Israel. And I'd leave the room thinking in some cases, wow, we agreed on 90 plus percent of the issues. We, you know, they, they were willing to talk about the issues in a way that you don't read about in the press. It was a two day event, if I'm not mistaken. And then you'd go into the main arena where they all make their made for TV speeches pounding on the table and you hear what you read in the press, which is very anti-Israel. You know, some of the same people who spoke so eloquently and honestly and rationally to me behind closed doors, still at the time, and some still do today, feel the need to say certain things in public that are harmful to peace, that aren't harm, that, that are harmful to even their own countries, and that will never ever bring peace. But nevertheless, I left thinking, because of the first part of the meeting, that there is hope there, no doubt despite the public postures of the second part of the meeting. How did you get along with King Abdullah? I have to say that I visited that car museum that you write about in the book, and I thought it was fascinating. Um, and he's an interesting guy from the political perspective for the West and for the United States. What was your opinion of King Abdullah? I have a lot of respect for him. I think he's a great leader for a very complicated country. He's honest, he's direct, he's not a, a, polit a politician kind of leader that you sit with him and say, he, he says empty words and a lot of diplo speak and then you don't feel like you got anything out of the meeting. I found him quite uh, to be quite the opposite. He knows the situation that he's in. He understands he has a very, uh, quite a number of Palestinians, a very high level of the Palestinian population. He was always respectful to Israel and its issues, even if he didn't agree with Israel and its issues. He never said anything bad about Prime Minister Netanyahu, then Prime Minister Netanyahu, though they certainly had their issues and disagreements. And in fact, I'm not even sure that they met during the time that we were there. And um, we disagreed, no doubt, on things like Jerusalem, uh, Malki Roth, the, you know, the, the young lady who was killed by that bloodthirsty terrorist Tamimi, who is now harbored in Jordan. Uh, it's a complicated issue, but we disagreed on that. And we and were can able I to- Can stop you there for a second and just You raised Malki Roth with the King of Jordan? Not initially, but down the road, we had to surround it. It wasn't something that was my mandate at the White House, but at some point people became aware of it and uh, it's complicated. You know, I don't agree with how they handle it. It wasn't a top issue because we were busy working on the peace agreement and both the Abraham Accords and the Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement. Um, and I think it's an issue that we here in the United States don't talk about enough. I think we should be talking about it more. I'm not saying that there is a solution to it, but I think it's something that should be top of mind for us at the moment. Thank you. I'm sorry to jump in here, but I yeah. just wanted to make that one clear. So on an over, you know, to summarize on an overall, um, on an overall answer to your question, despite disagreements about the conflict, uh, I found him to be a very important partner, both to America and to the peace process. He's an essential partner to whatever peace process may happen down the road. And one of the people that seems to have a, um, a mixed place in this whole conversation is uh, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia. President Trump, when he visited Saudi Arabia, took a really hard line on the responsibility of the Arab states to control 
Islamic fundamentalism to control the outward manifestations, the violent manifestations of Islamic fundamentalism. He was tremendously firm. He thought he was terrifically firm. And it appears that the Saudis took him quite seriously. And there have been changes in Saudi Arabia. Where do you think the Saudis are today? I think they continue to implement those changes. I think they uh, and their neighbors recognize that essentially, and I'm, I'm not exactly quoting President Trump, but this was the message that he gave when he was in front of all these Arab leaders in May of 2017, that this is a battle of good versus evil. And you could either be with us and fight it and it's in your backyard. And while we might support you in some way, really you're the ones that have to be at the front line of fighting this. I think Saudi Arabia took it to heart. I think other countries took it to heart. And while we'll always be fighting that battle, unfortunately, I think they have become more and more reliable, all of them, in fighting this battle of good versus evil. So you offer in the book <clears throat> two essential reasons that the Gulf Arabs <clears throat> were interested in relations with Israel, more overt relations with Israel, their internal dynamics and the threat of Iran. So it seems to me that one of the things that frightened Arab governments, particularly Gulf Arab governments, a decade ago was the Arab Spring and America's insistence upon a kind of Western style democratic standard for their countries. They had to find a way to be in the 21st century without being swallowed by it. So my first question is, have they done it? Um, maybe that's my question, have they done it? One of my very favorite things in the entire Middle East, other than moving the US embassy to Jerusalem, was the establishment of a bet din in Saudi in Arabia that sits in Bahrain. And is that a signal of where the Arabs have come in their relations with Jews as well as their relations with Israel? So let me first address the Western style, right? It's real, and this was very much what President Trump felt. It's not for us to dictate to other countries how to live their lives. And this was also one of the main themes of his message in May of 2017. Of course, we wanna go there, we wanna to explain to people why we think our way is the right way, better, however you wanna style it. But we can't make demands out of countries to live you know, like Americans do, to give the freedoms like Americans have. It would be nice to think about it, but their countries weren't built that way. The people weren't educated that way, trained that way. They may not behave the right way, you know, if you try to impose on them. That said, the message does ring and resonate with them. And I think not so much because any particular president or someone from Congress might have visited and pushed that agenda, but rather these leaders recognize that the world has changed around them too. And they are, they continue to make tremendous progress in terms of, you know, keeping their foot in the door in terms of what's important to them from a religious perspective, from a conservative perspective, conservative society, but at the same time, modernizing. One of the nicest things I see, and I'm back in Saudi Arabia as well as other countries, but this is peculiar to Saudi Arabia is when I'm around, you know, I don't wanna say driving on the highways there because I don't yet feel comfortable driving there myself, but seeing women driving, um, seeing women in business meetings, seeing women in government meetings, not just sitting in the background taking notes, but taking, you know, actively part, you wouldn't know who's, you know, higher up other than perhaps Perhaps the person in the middle who you know is the highest in the room, you wouldn't know who's higher. So the whole society is morphing and we're gonna to have to be patient and let them morph. As to, I guess I would say part two of your question, the Beit Din Judaism, the same kind of thing. I mean, I can't tell you the joy that I take in two things. One, when friends of mine, business associates of mine, acquaintances travel to the region across the board and they come back and they report to me how they felt in these countries it's how I felt during the three years that I was at the White House. I'm so glad that others get to experience the warmth, the welcome of being Jewish in the region. It still has a long way to go, not because they don't want it to go there, but because it's brand new, right? Um, I was on a recent trip to Saudi Arabia. At the time, I was still saying Kaddish for my father. My Havelis period is actually over now, the 12 months of mourning. Kaddish ended a month ago, but I said Kaddish in Saudi Arabia openly. We had a minion, a quorum of 10 men. Uh, there were some women there as well. And the Saudi, uh, our Saudi hosts were walking around us. And I didn't feel remotely uncomfortable. And you want to understand why? It's because religion is important to them too, right? Some are secular the way we are in Judaism. Some are religious. Some are extremely religious. 
but none of it was foreign to them. None of it was strange to them. None of it was deemed backward. Uh, we have a lot of similar characteristics, customs and traditions, and I feel thoroughly at home because of that. And I think that's why you'll continue to see whether it's debased in or other things continue to grow. We had a question from a listener, and by the way, listeners, you can use the Q&A function on your Zoom screen, and I'm, on, I'm monitoring, so I'll see it. But we had a question from a listener who says, what are the Abraham Accords Arab countries doing to change street opinion about Israel and Jews? I mean, your experience in Saudi Arabia uh, was at one level. How does this translate down into the street to regular people? Uh, a very important question, but not just the Abraham Accords signing countries, but perhaps even more so the countries that I like to call not yet Abraham Accord signing countries. Because in a country like the United Arab Emirates, it's a small population. Uh, so is Bahrain, by the way. And mostly they take their, um, their thinking from the top. So if their leader, MBC, who they deeply respect and admire, believes this is the right thing to do, most of them are going to feel like it's the right thing to do and go along. Um, also, the education there, while it wasn't ideal before the Abraham Accords was signed, they were much more tolerant, much more open, much more open to Western society, so it was an easier change. Where there remains a lot of work to be done is in a place like Saudi Arabia, where it wasn't as open a society. Um, and they are trying to make strides and revamp their education. You know, they could be pro-Palestinian and pro-Palestinian state, but that doesn't mean they have to be anti-Israel. That doesn't mean that they have to trash Israel or Judaism. And they know that and they're working on it, but it will take time. So you're right that I had a certain um, entree level and the experience that I had while at the White House wasn't exactly the man on the street. But I could tell you that from the end of 2019, continuing through to today, because I am there frequently and I do meet many of the men and women on the street, um, the amount of Shabbat Shalom's I get now the um, optimistic, hopeful discussions about Israel and peace coming out of Qatar and Saudi Arabia and other countries who haven't yet signed the Abraham Accords, it leaves me with that same sort of optimistic feeling. A long way to go, perhaps, but we are definitely on the right track. And we hope we stay on the right track. But the second thing that moved them, according to, to the book, and I think everybody would agree with you, that moved those countries was the fear, is the fear, of the role of Iran in the region. Um, you call Iran and the United States strong horses with which the Gulf states want to be allied out of their concerns about Iran. If the United States withdraws from the region, or if the United States empowers Iran, is Israel a strong enough force by itself to keep the Gulf states wedded to this? Uh, if it isn't, what happens to the Abraham Accords? So one thing when we started that was clear is that the region in its entirety, not just Israel, but the Arab countries all felt abandoned by America. Um, I think they feel that way potentially now. They don't really know how to feel, right? Because every week it's, we're on the cusp of signing the Iran deal. We're on the cusp of signing it, but no, we're not signing it. And the news this week is a bit frightening. Um, today, I think they're saying, oh, well, not so fast again, but we'll see. I don't, I don't know what's going on behind closed doors, so I can't say one way or the other. Um, if the Iran deal falls apart, I think we'll be in that same situation where they understand that they need each other, that is Ar the Arab countries and Israel need each other. They certainly need the United States and they'll work for ways for trying to figure out a plan B. By the way, there may be no plan B and that's something we might have to accept. If the Iran deal is signed, then I think everyone is going to reorient themselves to trying to protect themselves and see how it's going to work. You did see, for example, the UAE has agreed to exchange ambassadors again with Iran. I think that happened this week. I don't blame them. I know people are upset and they say, oh, but what about the Abraham Accords? The same way those on the call, I imagine most of us on the call say, it's not for us to dictate to Israel how it should protect itself and we can tell Israel what its policies should be. I think we owe the UAE the same respect. If the UAE leadership decides that given the um, uncertainty of the region and America's stance with respect to Iran and whether a deal is, is signed or isn't signed, the uncertainty in the, after, in the aftermath of a deal or no deal, if it makes sense to them in order to protect themselves, their country, their wealth, their people, that they should exchange ambassadors and have ties with Iran, we can't argue otherwise. In fact, I'll take it a step further. 
if I was on MBZ's, uh, the UAE leader's advisory board, if I was sitting in the room with him in his, ver uh, in his Oval Office, so to speak, and he said to me, Jason, this is what I want to do. How do you feel about it? What do you think the backlash will be on the Abraham Accords? I would say, Your Royal Highness, you have a right to do what you think is best for your country and it shouldn't affect the Abraham Accords and people shouldn't criticize you. Yeah, Iran has um, clearly believes that it is in the driver's seat at the moment. And I understand it issued overt threats to those uh, to the Abraham Accord countries and those who haven't yet signed or haven't yet made a decision about it, uh, not to have US bases in their countries and not to cooperate with Israel. I think you can only do that if you think you're winning. So I have great concerns about where they're going to be. So we have another question from a, um, from a listener who asks whether the United States based its agreements, our agreements on financial and commercial aspects unique to each Arab country. In other words, were we making sets of bilateral deals at the same time we were um, helping to coordinate and negotiate the Abraham Accords? I don't think there was a sort of quid pro quo, if you will. I know that's a dirty word or a dirty phrase, but I don't think it was a quid pro quo. Hey, UAE signed this deal with Israel. And in, in addition to that, or sort of to induce you to do that, please buy you know, X billion dollars worth of military equipment or anything like that. There might have been military equipment that they wanted to buy for their own use that was discussed around the deal. I know there was some controversy about whether or not they were promised certain equipment or not as part of the deal. Um, I, you know, I won't comment on it. Frankly, I also don't know because I wasn't in the room at the time. But it's always in America's interest when our allies and friends in a particularly volatile region get along and strengthen each other because it reduces the need for America to be involved. That doesn't mean we aren't you know, we can walk away from this we can't for so many reasons but at the same time having our friends and allies work together in and of itself is extraordinarily valid extraordinarily valuable to america you've been quoted as saying in both business and life bringing people together and working to unite rather than to divide is the strongest path to success i truly believe that this is this approach is one that can yield uh, results for the United States in matters all over the world. It's a great statement, and it sounds like exactly the way the Abraham Accords happened. But I have a question, because if I didn't have a question, what would we be doing here? Um, what if one side doesn't want what the other side thinks it wants to see success? This seems to be true of um, Iran as well as of the Palestinians. That's the splitting the difference question. It's the question of where the U.S negotiation with Iran is going on the subject of nuclear weapons. If you have different end games, how do you negotiate a comfortable settlement for both sides? So this leads to the other part of that question. Do you still believe that there is a possibility, maybe in the future, maybe not for a very long time, of a two-state solution in which Israel shares territory that it currently controls? Can we find a common end game? The, well, so first, I just want to clarify that I don't believe in the phrase two-state solution, and I'll tell you why. It means different things to different people uh, for a variety of reasons, but primarily in terms of security. If by two-state solution people mean a fully sovereign Palestinian state in which Israel withdraws from and doesn't get to do anything in terms of security to keep itself safe, then I don't believe in it, because I think Gaza has shown us that left to its own devices, there will be Palestinians. I'm not saying all, I'm not saying Palestinians are terrorists, but the reality is the region has a certain segment of a society that will always want to destroy Israel and not just Israel. Some of those people may also be against uh, Arab governments, Arab monarchies, you know, pick your thing for different reasons. But if it means asking a friend and ally, irrespective of my Judaism and my support for Israel for other reasons, hey, we know you've been under attack since the moment of your formation, but we're asking you to take a leap of faith, withdraw from the land and hope for the best. No, I think that would be a crazy result. But using your phrase or the common phrase two state solution in the context of a bunch of rules and regulations that keep Israel safe as we did, at least I hope we did right in our peace plan. Um, I am optimistic, but there's quite a number of things that have to change. One, we have to stop ignoring Hamas, right? You have 2 million Palestinians suffering in Gaza. 
who are ruled under the iron fist of Hamas. And we can't pretend that that's not the case. It took me probably three weeks before I summoned up the courage to say this to my State Department and National Security Council colleagues after they helped educate me and they kept ignoring Hamas. And I said, well, you know, in the best of circumstances, if we get President Abbas and Bibi Netanyahu in a room and we manage to put down a plan that they both say, wow, you guys are geniuses. How did you come up with something we could actually talk about in good faith and where do we sign? What does that mean for Israel in terms of Gaza? Hamas still vows to destroy Israel. Uh, you know the answer I got? Shh. Don't talk about that. Just talk about the two-state solution. So, you know, until we fix that or, or try to figure out how to fix that, or until Hamas changes its stripes, which is unlikely, though not impossible, but quite unlikely, very hard to envision. But I'll, an I'll end the answer with a more optimistic note. Uh, and this is as recently as last week. It's just one example of so many. I had lunch in uh, Malaya Dumim, which some would call a settlement. I call it, at this point, it's probably a city, with an Israeli Arab friend of mine. He, he considers himself more Palestinian, but he's from Jerusalem, he's Israeli Arab. And he's as pro-Palestinian as you can get. In fact, he has a factory and wants a Palestinian state. We didn't get into the details of whether that includes all of East Jerusalem. He's a rational guy, I'm sure. With a guy like him, you can make a deal. But um, he wants to see a successful Palestinian state, but also wants to see Israel successful and wants nothing more than to have his kids and Israeli kids grow up and thrive and prosper together. And I did see, so I met so many Palestinians like that. So I do remain optimistic, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of hoops to go through between now and that wish. That which we might want to have. Yes. I suspect that has to do more with leadership than with people on the ground. You wrote about um, Yasser Arafat at the UN in 1974, saying to the General Assembly, don't let the olive branch slip out of my hand. He meant that if he gave up on peace and turned to war, he'd already turned to war, but never mind. It would be the UN's fault, or it would be the world's fault for not giving him what he wanted. You also said that Abbas said the same thing to you when he complained about Democrats who failed to deliver for him in their eight years prior. Is it always somebody else's fault that the Palestinians don't do what they need to do for success? Is that one of the things that upset the Gulf states who decided that maybe going with the Palestinians wasn't always a good idea? Yeah, I hate to say it, and, and this, let's distinguish between the leadership in Ramallah and the people, but to the leadership, sadly, it is always somebody else's fault. Uh, and yes, the, many of the Arab states recognize that while they support the Palestinian people, and frankly would want nothing more than a fully sovereign Palestinian state with all the bells and whistles that the Palestinians always ask for, claim, demand, however you want to argue it. But they also realize that what they're demanding and how they're conducting themselves isn't the way to get to where they need. And they want to keep their money in their own countries, right? These countries are building out massive amounts of infrastructure, businesses, you name it, they're building it. Imagine if they didn't have to keep funding into a cause because the leadership that's running that cause would actually negotiate in good faith and maybe achieve something. So they're, they're on to the Palestinian leadership, but it's going to take time to change that. I understand that most of the Palestinians outside funds now come from the United States and the European Union, that in fact, the Gulf states have pretty well cut off the Palestinians. And maybe that's enough, or maybe it would be enough in concert with the rest of us to get them to see things differently. I'm not sure. I wish it were true, but we cut off funds to the Palestinians. And what happens is it's sort of like you plug one lead Okay, we've, we've lost you there for a second, Jason. You are frozen. So I'm not sure what you need to do to get back to us. And we're gonna wait here for a minute because Jason Greenblatt has become frozen.
We're going to ask you to be patient with us during a um, technical glitch. See if we can get him back. Okay, Jason, you're muted. If you unmute yourself, I think we're back in business. Okay, sorry, I seem to have lost you. It's okay. Um, but we lost you um, where you were talking about filling holes, you know, when, when one. Yeah. Okay, so if you would go back to that answer and, and give it to us again. So as an example, when President Trump cut off funds from the Palestinians, the Europeans in particular rushed to fill that gap, which makes any kind of move whether it's less money coming from the Gulf or from the United States, less effective. It's very similar to the sanctions that were imposed on Iran. The Europeans undermined our sanctions because they wanted to do business with Iran. They could care less about the safety and security of Israel and its Arab neighbors. They just wanna do business. And when they undermine the sanctions, the sanctions don't work as well. That's just the, the way it works. So cutting money, it's not the tool that people believe it. It's still a useful tool, but it doesn't have the impact that people think it has. So I can understand why the Europeans would think that doing business with Iran um, was a good idea. I don't like it, but I understand what they were doing and it's financial. But what is their interest in undermining our sanctions with the Palestinians? Is that an anti-Israel? Is it an anti-Semitic? Why would they do that? Well, they didn't agree with our approach at all. If anything, the Europeans were probably the worst partners we had on the on the file. So the Arab countries were willing to listen, engage thoughtfully, honestly, and ultimately ended up signing the Abraham Accords. The Europeans just, they think differently. They think the Palestinians should have that demand met. Uh, some of it is anti-Israel, not all, you know, each country is different. Leadership is different in each country from time to time. But they, um, even today, for example, European NGOs gobble up land in Judea and Samaria, not, you know, in, in a way that's so pernicious that's hardly talked about, but that further complicates the issue. People talk about settlements, right? When they talk about settlements, of course, they're only talking about Jewish settlements, Jewish neighborhoods being built in what people call the West Bank, or I prefer Judea and Samaria, which should never be called occupied Palestinian territory. That's a false label. But they never talk about Palestinians building in those areas as well. And it's a complicated subject. Palestinians either can't get permission to build there or don't want to ask permission because they don't want to show that Israel has control. That's a fair discussion that we can engage in. But at least don't be dishonest and recognize that Palestinians are building there and farming there in vast ways. So let's talk about that too. Turning to the book for a moment, and this is keyed off of the idea that the Europeans are not very helpful to us. Um, you're actually very mild in the book. You, you seem like a very calm person in the book. And you have kind words for many people in the State Department and actually a few for people like Saeed Arakat. Um, were you angrier than you appeared to be? Were you more upset with the Pentagon or more upset with Arakat than shows up in the book? And I have to say, you must have been the only person not surprised by Mahmoud Abbas's outburst in Germany uh, last week. Um. I was never angry with anybody, except maybe John Kerry and Obama after they uh, did what they did at the UN Security Council just weeks before President Trump assumed the presidency. Uh, look, Saab Erkot has passed away. Um, I know him, I know I knew him, I know his wife, I know his son. You know, I've, I've held his a picture of his grandson in my hand. Uh, my approach has always been to try to be a mensch, to try to see that although I vehemently disagree with somebody's opinion, they're still a human being, they're still a person, they're still part of a family, somebody's wife or husband or child or however you wanna style them. So we had heated discussions, it's true, and we were polar opposites in terms of how to view the conflict, but at the end of the day, he was fighting for what he believed in. Uh, so whether it's because he's passed on that my description of him was perhaps mild, to use your word, or it's my nature, um, I don't find that being too heated yields results. So I am firm in my convictions and my positions and my arguments, and I try hard, don't always succeed, to not lose my cool. When it comes to President Abbas, look, he's a complicated guy. Um, the reason I wasn't surprised, and I covered this in the book, is he had these anti-Semitic um, papers that he wrote when he was a student in Moscow, 
very few people talk about it. I quoted verbatim in the book. He had, while we were in the, while I was in the White House, a similarly nasty comment about the Holocaust. And to be to give credit where it's due, including to Europe, that he was roundly condemned then, as he was roundly condemned this time. But I'll explain the other side of President Abbas, and I'm not saying that this is the true side of him. Like most people, in particular world leaders, they're complicated. After a particularly contentious meeting between President Abbas and President Trump at the UN General Assembly, a really contentious meeting, um, President Abbas was about to leave the room, disappointed, angry, frustrated, however you want to style it. And he came up to me and he kissed my head and he said, Shana Tova. He didn't have to do that. You know, first of all, the president was there. I wasn't even nearly the most important person in the room. I think we have the Secretary of State, Jared Kushner and others, maybe our national security advisor. But he sought me out to do that. He had nothing to gain from it. So um, here too, I disagree with him. I think his comments about the Holocaust multiple times were ugly. Um, I don't even know that he, I, I guess I would say he actually in some ways believes those comments, which makes it worse. Um, but, you know, there's a side to him that if he had the courage could potentially lead his people to something amazing and would keep Israel in, in so much a safer spot. But my conclusion today is he doesn't have the courage to do it. So we have to wait. Um, but I imagine that Israel can wait. I think it's harder for the Palestinian people to wait uh, because they really don't have so many things that they probably should have. Uh, we have a listener who says, other than undoing everything Trump, in quotes, can you tell us what the Biden administration rationale is uh, for at best ignoring the Abraham Accords or undermining the Abraham Accords and for pursuing a negotiated um, nuclear deal with Iran? So I'll start with the Iran deal because it's really the most important um, issue of the day. Uh, I think they're naive. I think that, well, it could be one of two things. They're naive and they believe the Iranian regime wants what Americans want. They want a good life with their kids running around and picket fences and streets and playing soccer and thriving and prospering. The Iranian regime doesn't. They want nothing more than to destroy Israel, probably destroy, but they probably can't, you know, they can't, but they would destroy America if given a chance. And they want to take over all of the Middle East. You know, those beautiful gleaming towers in Abu Dhabi or Dubai or Doha, they want to be living there, but they want to be living there under their theocracy. I don't think the Biden administration understands that. The alternative argument is, while they might understand it, they just want to buy time. They, you know, they figure in two years, you know, let's buy two years, let Iran create terrorism by giving them all this money. Let's hope that they don't cheat on the nuclear deal, which is a very, very naive way to look at it. But even if they don't cheat, we'll figure it out in two years. But we have to face our kids and our grandkids. Do you want to face them and say, well, we buried our head in the sand for a couple of years and congratulations, now it's your problem. Um, that's unfortunately how I think the Biden administration is thinking. They want to buy time. Uh, to go back to the first part of the question, which now I regret because I forgot what it was. <laughs> what was the question? Well, I, I think, now let's stay on, let's stay on this if, if we can, um, because I don't have first part. Of, oh, well, you know, undoing everything Trump. Oh, yeah, yeah. Was, Look, it, it are, we, are we trying to undo everything Trump in this administration, which would include the Abraham Accords as well as sanctions. Yeah, it, it bears mentioning because um, one of my favorite videos to watch, and if your listeners haven't seen it, Google it, Ned Price, Abraham Accords, State Department spokesperson. There's a scene early on, I don't remember when, but it was before Afghanistan, where a reporter, might have been a Fox reporter, kept asking him, Ned Price, why don't you use the term Abraham Accords? And you could see Ned squirming and well, I'm saying what they are, the normalization agreements, the normalization agreements. Uh, until Afghanistan, they just didn't want to give Trump the credit. And that would include, of course, using the correct name for the accords that President Trump successfully shepherded through, as well as Jared Kushner and so many others. Um, they since, after the Afghanistan fiasco, started to use it. I think the withdrawal from Afghanistan was so bad, make this look so, made us look so bad, that they were reaching for any possible foreign policy initiative that they could sink their teeth into. So good for them. They reoriented themselves. They now use the term. They say they support it. I believe they try to support it. But until we figure out what's going on with Iran, I think it's going to be hard to make significant traction. We have seen some bright spots. They had the Negev summit with all the foreign ministers involved. It's a good thing. I, I credit the Biden administration for that. 
But even there, they kind of fall short. We had Secretary Blinken once again bring in the Palestinians and say, you know, this can't be a substitute for the Palestinians. And my answer is, they're not there. We took away the veto card. Don't give it back to them. But we have given it back to them to some extent. To some extent. Um, okay, so we're coming closer to the end of this program. And people who listen to the JPC webinars know that I like to end a program on a positive note. So let me do two positive notes. One is to remind people to buy the book because the book is amazing. You will learn a lot about how people do things in Washington. And Jason Greenblatt came to Washington, not as a politician, not as a man with experience in the way things are normally done here. And that is actually a really good thing. So buy the book. So the second is I need to find a question, the answer to which is positive. And you and I had settled on one. So the question is this, your parents were Hungarian refugees to the United States, but you were born and raised here and you achieved a lot of success through your parents on your own with their backing in your life. In your experience, how has this country changed in recent decades? And the classic question, is it good for the Jews? In so many ways, the country just keeps changing for the positive, right? We, as, an, as a child of immigrants, doesn't matter where they came from or that I'm Jewish, but imagine what my grandmother or grandparents, I only really knew one grandmother, but what my grandparents would have felt if they saw me being sworn in by the, I think it was the vice president who swore all of us in, but in front of the president. Um, they fled Hungary at different times, one just at the cusp of when the Nazis were coming into um, Hungary, one in 1956, is, you know, during the, or after the Hungarian revolution. And uh, I don't think they barely spoke English they started off poor and then they ended up at the White House. So what a beautiful country. On the other hand, I would say, you know, what was it 10 or so years ago? I don't remember exactly when we started to have uh, CSS, this amazing organization that protects our synagogues start posting volunteers in front of our synagogues. And today they're even more um, hardened with uh, bulletproof vests and all that. Our country has its significant challenges, uh, whether we're Jewish or not, we're not the only ones who get killed. Um, there have been churches that have been attacked, schools, whatever it is. Uh, there are bad people here. But on an overall basis, um, I, I, I continue to feel blessed. I think our country, while it um, needs some course correction, and I think part of that is stitching our society back together again, uh, being more sane and rational and being able to disagree agreeably. And my point on that is if I could do that for one of the most complicated, fraught, conflicts in the world, um, always leave the room while disagreeing, but still having friends among all the Arabs, including, okay, maybe not Hamas, but many Palestinians, um, we could do it. So I'm hopeful. I think it's an amazing country. I feel blessed to live here. I feel like I'd left out one segment of your question though. Nope. That good. was, how was it good for the Jews? Look, like anything that's good oh, for the Jews. Oh, good for the Jews, Jews. yes. yes. Right? I, so, I still I, think it remains good for the Jews despite a significant uptick in anti-Semitism. I think we're thriving here like never before. And uh, I'm hopeful for my kids, even though I know that we still have a lot of work to do to do some course correction. That's a good optimistic answer. It's never perfect. Our kids won't think it's perfect. Our grandchildren won't think it's perfect, but it's pretty darn good. So on that note, Jason Greenblatt, I wanna thank you for a tremendous webinar for us, uh, for our listeners for enlightening us and for helping us see the world the way it is and maybe the world the way we hope it can be. Um, oh, a listener writes in, I hope you run for public office. Congress needs you. Any thoughts? You don't have to answer that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. It was great to speak to you. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you very much. We hope to see you again.